Hi, in this lecture I'm going to give a quick intuitive understanding of how we can visually think of eigenvectors and eigenvalues. I won't really be going in depth in the computation of these just because I assume that this is all review and that would kind of require an in-depth understanding of earlier concepts which I didn't provide in these lectures uh, just because it's all meant to be review and also that we don't really need to have a super in-depth understanding of how to hand compute eigenvectors and eigenvalues and this is just kind of meant for a main segue into understanding eigen decomposition, which will be in the next lecture. Okay, so let's give kind of a visual understanding of what these terms mean. So say we have some Cartesian plane. Great. So say if we have some vectors, v1, and another vector that's orthogonal to it, v2. All right, so remember in one of our past lectures, we talked about how we can think of matrix vector multiplication, so some ax equals x prime as a linear transformation. So instead of thinking of this ax as some function a that takes in some vector x and kind of places this vector x somewhere else uh, in the Cartesian plane, so some x prime, so kind of moving the vectors x to x prime. At the end of that lecture, I kind of gave an intuition as a good way to understand a linear transformation is as a transformation of the entire space. So basically thinking of every possible point x in this Cartesian plane getting fed into this function, which just multiplies it by a, and getting replaced to some other place in the board, x prime. So you can imagine if we took this plane and we took every possible point in this plane and transformed it by some matrix a, every single one of these points would move in some direction dictated by the matrix. Because this matrix kind of encodes that transformation. So you imagine all these points going somewhere, uh, basically where the matrix tells them to. So each of these little points, you feed it into this AX and that gets transformed somewhere else. So you can almost think of it as the entire grid lines of your Cartesian plane getting shifted um, as a result of this matrix transformation. But say that the vectors V1 and V2 and every other vector along this line, every other vector that's collinear with these vectors, after undergoing this transformation, you can kind of imagine all these points moving somewhere, but imagine that every point along these lines, so every point uh, collinear with v1 and v2, don't change direction. So you can think of every one of these little vectors kind of changing uh, the direction of their head going somewhere, but you can think of these vectors along this line just simply stretching or squishing along this line. So simply put, every other vector except for the ones along v1 and v2 are changing directions, but everything along here just stays along this, uh, these lines there. Simply put, v1 and v2 are the eigenvectors of A. If A encodes the transformation and v1 and v2 still stay along these lines, that means they're the eigenvectors. But these eigenvectors can scale up and down, so v1 can actually extend to v, uh, to become up, to, you know, v1 might extend to be this length after undergoing the transformation a, but it still stands on this line. But the, but the, um, the scaling number, the number that scales this v1 to this new place after undergoing the transformation is the eigenvalue. So the eigenvalue of this vector is how much this stretches or squeezes after undergoing the transformation. Same thing here, this might have some lambda 2 uh, that stretches and squeezes this vector after the, um, after the transformation. But other than that, every other point moves directions. So the formula makes a lot more sense after understanding this visual kind of understanding. The formula for eigenvectors and eigenvalues is a v equals lambda v, where v are the eigenvectors of a and lambda are the eigenvectors of a. You can see that when we transform v by a, it simply equals v multiplied by some scalar constant. Uh, so you can kind of think of it as v doesn't change directions, um, because it's still, you know, after undergoing that transformation, it's still going heading in that same direction of v, just scaled by some constant. So that's the formula that ties everything together. The definition of both eigenvectors and eigenvalues is stored in that formula. But that's how you think of them kind of um, intuitively, I guess. Some other things to remember is that sometimes uh, eigenvectors aren't, eigenvalues and eigenvectors aren't really that pretty. Sometimes you might get eigenvalues that are not real numbers. 
um, but the thing is we're, off, we're almost always going to be dealing with uh, matrices A that are symmetric, and when you have symmetric positive uh, matrices A, uh, you can kind of guarantee that your eigenvalues are always going to be real numbers, and you're always going to have it so that your eigenvectors of a symmetric matrix are always going to be orthogonal to each other. So that's just another thing and another nice thing to consider since we're going to be dealing mostly with symmetric matrices. So we're not going to be having to deal with any non-real numbers. Another kind of interesting visualization of what eigenvectors and eigenvalues do is seeing how they distort the unit circle. So say we have some Cartesian point here and we point and we kind of create two eigenvectors here. A popular thing to do with eigenvectors is to, as we mentioned in the, in the lecture where we first introduced unit vectors, is to make them so that they have a unit length, that they have a norm of one. And you can do that because anything along the direction of the eigenvector is still an eigenvector. So you can simply just um, scale down that eigenvector to make it have a length of one. So say we have, um, we've modified these to become unit eigenvectors, each with a norm of one. And both of these have a norm of one, and these are um, perpendicular to each other because we have the eigenvectors of a symmetric matrix. So say we have all those conditions met, so we just have some two unit uh, eigenvectors uh, pointing like this and this in the Cartesian plane. So say if we kind of uh, use, a, you know, we kind of draw a unit circle that goes around these. So we kind of, you know, draw a unit circle and this will have a radius of one since these eigenvectors are each one long. So, say we use our transformation A, right? So this is the untransformed space, but when we, under, when we use the transformation A, these are gonna stretch along these axes by the uh, scaling factor, which is the eigenvalue. Every other point here will be moving somewhere else and changing directions, but we're just considering the eigenvalues and how they change. So after undergoing the transformation A, so under, after transform, tra transforming like that, let's see maybe what our new plane could look like. So maybe this uh, unit eigenvector gets stretched way in this direction. So that means the uh, eigenvector associated with this is quite positive because it's stretched a lot. And let's say that the eigenvector in this direction was actually less than one, so it actually made it shorter. So that means so let's say this is v2, v1, so that means lambda 2 is less than, uh, less than 1, sorry, and lambda 1 is uh, greater than 1 just by kind of viewing how these scale. And this is going to be our resulting new, let's say, v prime 1, v prime 2. So that's going to be our eigenvectors after undergoing this transformation. And now let's kind of draw an ellipse around these. Right, if you can imagine this kind of going in the same direction. So this is just kind of a nice way to visually understand what happens to the eigenvectors after undergoing some transformation. So when looking at the stretching of this ellipse, you can kind of generally see how the, eigenve how the eigenvalues stretch the eigenvectors after going under transformation A. So that's just a nice way to visually understand what eigenvalues and eigenvectors do. All right, that's all I have for today. In the next lecture, I'll be talking about eigen decomposition, which is kind of arguably the most important thing we can get out of this for machine learning and understanding this textbook. Okay, see you in the next video.